for joining me, ladies and gentlemen. I will start uh, the webcast now about the generic deep circulatory body lumbar spine model. Um, my name is uh, Marc Bizet, and I will be the presenter today. And uh, I'm a key, he uh, is the host. Uh, and turn uh, Johan Christensen. He will, uh, he will he will help uh, to answer questions during the presentation. It is um, possible to ask questions uh, both during the presentation and after the presentation. And the way you do that is you will click on the question mark in the right uh, bottom of the screen. Um, and that launches uh, the question and answer panel. Then type, uh, type the question in the question and answer panel. Uh, and it is important that you send the question to the host center and the panelists, and this way everybody is able to uh, to see the questions. Um, and uh, uh, Søren Søren, he will try to answer questions uh, during the presentation, and some of the questions uh, we keep uh, for myself, and I will try to answer the questions after the presentation. Um, please notice that the answer displays next to the question in the question answer box, and you may have to scroll up to, to see the questions. To see the so once again, uh, don't hesitate to ask questions both during and after the presentation. Um, for the latecomers uh, under us, uh, some people might still have problems to get sound, so that's why I have this um, website on, so people who don't have sound yet uh, have a chance to download instructions. I'll let, I'll let this on the screen for a short while so everybody has a chance to uh, get the sound working. All right, thank you very much. So now we continue. Uh, so that my name is uh, Marc Vizet, and uh, at the moment I'm affiliated with uh, two institutions, uh, the Institute of Mechanical Engineering at the Albor University in Denmark, also the Department of Health Science and Technology, and the Center for Sensory Motor Interaction at the Albor University in Denmark. Um, the agenda for, uh, for today is that I will start out with the introduction about why we want to build a lumbar spine model. Uh, then I go into the details um, about the spine model. I will tell you about uh, the joints, about the muscles, and also about the uh, intra-abdominal pressure. Um, and after that, I will um, tell you a little bit about, about what we did in order to validate the model. And I will end the session with, uh, to tell you a little bit about some ongoing and future work uh, concerning uh, uh, the cervical spine, and we are, and we will end this webcast by a question and answer session. So, the official spine project that we had here in in Albach, uh, started at, in 2002 and ended uh, in 2004. Uh, however, the work is still kind of uh, going on and, and uh, trying to improve the model. But um, this project was funded by the Danish Technical Research Council. And we had the following partners in the project. Um, first of all, in that, uh, in that time, the Institute of Mechanical Engineering at the Auburn University, which was represented by myself, John Rasmussen and Sir and Sir Holm Christensen. Uh, a second important partner was the Institute of Mechanic Medical Anatomy at the University of Copenhagen. Um, by the persons of Lone Hansen, who is an expert in anatomy, and E.S. Simonson. Um, then uh, we had the Danish Institute of Occupational Health in the person of Morten Essendrup. And Morten Essendrup is an expert in intra-abdominal pressure. Um, then also the Department of Sports Science at the University of Aarhus was one of the partners in the project in the person of Thomas Bull Anderson. 
And in order to get a clinical perspective, we had uh, Christian Bon, who is an uh, orthopedic surgeon, working for the Department of Orthopedics at the University Hospital in London. So it is a real uh, multidisciplinary project, uh, one could say. So let's try to explain why we want to build um, again a, a, a detailed lumbar spine model. Because there have already been some spine models in uh, literature. There are some examples by uh, Stuart McGill, Ian Stowe, and also uh, Duckfield and Essenson and Sweden. Um, the characteristics of these models is that they are based on locally developed software. And this makes it difficult uh, to share uh, between different research groups. Moreover, there are also differences in simulation and uh, modeling techniques, which also uh, makes it more di uh, difficult to compare results. Um, so that basically means that if you want to, if you have a basic research question about concerning the spine, uh, and you want to solve that by uh, using a model, you have, you have to start all over again. So you have to define a model, you have to define the segments, the joints, the muscles, and find the right parameters. Um, and also you have to develop, again, the equations, the equations of motions. You have to implement all this into a piece of software code, and last but not least, you have to solve uh, uh, this problem automatically. Uh, our philosophy is that these latter three parts can be done automatically by a system. Um, our approach is somewhat different than what you normally see in, uh, in the biomechanical community. What you normally see is that most research groups, they start with a research problem or a hypothesis, and they build a model to solve or to prove or disprove that particular problem or hypothesis. Our approach uh, is somewhat different. We want to build a, a general model um, that can give information about, about a number of yet unknown problems. Uh, and this approach also implies that the model we want to build should be flexible and it should be, uh, it should be possible to modify the model quite easily. So our goal was to develop a general detailed spine model that can predict uh, muscle and vector forces in the lumbar spine for the movement of forgiving external forces. Moreover, we, we think it's important that our model facilitate sharing um, so people can download our model and, and, uh, and use it. Uh, it's also important for us that, that the model, uh, people should have the possibility to scrutinize and improve the model uh, by other groups. So the model can be improved and it can be uh, 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 feedback to the, uh, to the public uh, uh, through a repository. So uh, the piece of software we used uh, was the Anybody Modeling System, um, which is a system for modeling and analysis of the musculoskeletal system. Uh, the main features are that this piece of software is based on inverse dynamics um, and optimization principles. So the movement and external forces are input in the system, and then the software calculates the necessary muscle forces to produce that movement balance these external forces. And it's an important feature is that uh, the models are written in, in, a, in some kind of programming language that we call any script. And these are, um, this script is text-based, so it therefore makes it quite easy to read the script and, and, and makes it also easy to, to share the models. Um, and it makes it possible uh, to, uh, to have models with hundreds of muscles to analyze this on a normal personal computer. Um, I would like to stress that in this webcast, I will not tell you too much about uh, the software itself, about uh, the possible, uh, 
committed to do half, but I will focus focus mainly on the, on the model. And the software here is basically a tool where we have built a model. But I will uh, I'm going to talk more about the model itself. Um, we had uh, the scientific outputs from this research project are two articles. Um, the first one was written by uh, Lorna Henson, the first author, and this is kind of a review about the anatomy and the biomechanics of the lumbar spine, a special reference to the biomechanical modeling, which was published uh, in Spine this year. Um, and this, uh, this review consists, um, has a lot of uh, parameter information that are necessary uh, for building a detailed spine model. And the second article, uh, which has just been accepted in the Journal of Biomechanics and is in press now, is more a description uh, of this model uh, and, and could be it's kind of uh, can be compared with uh, with this webcast actually. Um, I've also listed here um, uh, the website where you can uh, view the abstract and if you have access to uh, the LCC website, you can also download a PDF file. Um, if, you have, if you do not have time to write down this uh, PDF, uh, sorry, this, uh, this web address, we will send you the PDF file at this slides afterwards. So let's uh, try to tell you more about the model in detail. The lumbar spine uh, model consists of seven rigid segments. Uh, we have the pelvis, the five lumbar vertebrae, and the thoracic part. And this thoracic part is considered as, uh, as this. And the joints between the vertebrae are three degrees of freedom spherical joints, uh, or at least they are modeled like three degrees of freedom spherical joints. And the center of rotation um, it's based on uh, work of Pinch and Buck from, uh, from uh, 1988. And the center of rotation is an important parameter because um, that kind of decides what are the moments arms, uh, which are the effective moment arms of the different muscles uh, surrounding the lumbar spine. So now I will go through um, the most important muscles which are part of this, uh, of the lumbar spine model. Uh, first of all, uh, an important muscle of the lumbar spine is the, the multifidi muscle. And uh, these muscles are actually quite difficult to, to model. Uh, however, uh, the group of Bogdok from Australia, they did a lot of work as, uh, of dissecting, dissecting um, different cadavers in, in order to, uh, to, uh, to get detailed information about the multi um, And they really they divided the multi in different fascicles and they uh, gave some recommendations how to model uh, the multi muscle. So their recommendation was to uh, divide the multi in uh, two of some eight sides. And the multi CD has a, a deep part, uh, which you can see here, um, which uh, jumps over one vertebra. And then you have uh, the middle part, which uh, jumps over uh, more vertebra, I think two vertebra. And then you have a more superficial part, which jumps over about three to four vertebra. And in this way, you can uh, you, you get this kind of structure of the, the motor hidden. Um, the second Im important muscle in the, the lumbar spine is the, the erector spinae. And the erector spinae is a very complicated muscle. It, actually, it's not really an, one muscle. It consists of uh, uh, four divisions, uh, which are, are listed here. Uh, and again, we used information by the, by the group of Bogdok. Um, they recommend to divide uh, the erector spinae into 29 testicles on each side. And here in this picture here, you see the, the two past uh, lumborum deficiencies. And the past lumborum deficiencies are characterized by, let's say, um, a patch 
that originate from the, the longer first by itself and then they, uh, they are attached to the sarcom or the, or the, or the pelvis. Um, the erector spinae, the, the, the other two deficiencies are the past thoracus deficiencies. They are characterized that they are originate from uh, the ribs and they go all down to the sarcom again and to the, to the pelvis. So actually they don't, they do not touch the, the lumbar vertebra. However, they have a very big influence about uh, the moments and, and the reaction forces in the lumbar vertebra and they are really important uh, In order to, uh, to model um, uh, the lordosis, this uh, lumbar curvature, if you can see here, uh, we use so-called via points. And these via points are attached uh, to the, uh, they are attached on the, the lumbar vertebra. Uh, and uh, a via point you should see is a kind of a, uh, it's a kind of a ring of where the muscle uh, goes through. And here you see the, uh, the spine in, in upright position and the more flexed position. And uh, by using these via points you get uh, it is possible to get the, the right curvature of, uh, of the muscle. And they, and they kind of mimic the, the effect of the fascia to a columbar. Also, when a muscle in the, in the model is the psoas uh, major muscle, um, they are modeled as 11 fascicles on each side, and uh, so as major muscles have a, for a small moment on in flexion of extensive space, however, they can produce a quite uh, big extra force on the lumbar part, because it's uh, quite a strong muscle. Um, if so as major, they originate from the different parts of the, of the lumbar vertebra, as you can see here, but also here at the lower part, and then they uh, attach uh, to the femur, which you cannot see in this picture. Uh, and this point here versus a kind of a via point uh, on the velvet, uh, which is the near public eminence. So in reality, the muscle kind of continues to the femur, which is sitting somewhere here. Um, the next muscle we have is the quadratus lumborum. And this muscle was modeled by uh, using information by Stokes et al. from uh, 99. And it's divided uh, uh, in five fascicles on each side. And then I want to talk, you, uh, talk with you about uh, the abdominal muscles, which is. Um, the more complicated part of the model, actually. Um, there are four, four muscles in the abdominal part of the model. So that's the rectus abdominis, which is a, a spine flexor, and the obliquus externus, the obliquus internus, and the transversus. And also, what we try to do is to model the mechanical effect of the intra-abdominal pressure. And still some confer, confer First, in the literature about uh, how important this intra-abdominal pressure is and exactly what the mechanical condition um, is of this uh, intra-abdominal pressure. Um, so we follow some of the thoughts uh, introduced by, by Duxel and Parsonson, and uh, I think they have shown quite convincingly uh, in the Journal of Biomechanics in 97 that um, abdominal pressure can actually unload with the spine. And you can see, uh, you should see it like that, that the unloading mechanism is viewed as a pressurized column pushing the ribcage and the pelvis apart. Um, this is quoted from Dr. Axel's and Um uh, The muscle which is the most important muscle to create this pressure, pressure is the transversus. Um, so other muscles have an, have an influence on the, on the pressure, like the, the obliquus muscles. So uh, Paul Hodges uh, from Australia, for example, he showed that uh, the transversus is, is really the most important muscle to create pressure. 
So in order to include the intra-abdominal pressure in our model, we had we had uh, the following design requirements, one one could say. First of all, this intra-abdominal pressure needs to be an integral part of the whole muscle recruitment. Moreover, because it's still too controversial about how important it is, we, we found it important that it is easy to, to turn it off in the model uh, the way you like it. And um, the two main assumptions uh, were that we consider only the, tra the transversus as the muscle who can generate this abdominal pressure. And we idealize the pressure at column as a, as a cylinder. So let's start to, um, to see how, how we have built up this uh, abdominal part of the model. Uh, first of all, we define the kind of buccal artificial segment that we kind of have called the buccal segment. Uh, it's an artificial segment with no mass. This uh, segment mimics the direct seat where the muscles, like the obliquus muscle, uh, can attach on. And we define five discs um, which the transverse, transverse muscle can wrap around. Uh, also, these discs, they're kind of artificial segments and they don't have any mass. But they're important to, uh, uh, in order to, to describe the path of the transversal muscle. Uh, so as I said, this is another view of this so-called uh, buckle segment, which uh, mimics the rectus seat. It's um, an assembly point for, for the abdominal muscles from the different directions. So these discs, they can kind of move uh, along uh, the spine, and uh, depending on what kind of movement you, you, you do. So here you see a picture of a guy doing a lateral flexion. And the discs, they kind of move along with this movement, so you, you get a kind of natural way uh, of how the transversal uh, muscle uh, moves along the spine. We use the same for the flexion extension here, and also for rotation. This can move uh, uh, together with the spine. And now more about the abdominal pressure itself. Um, the intra-abdominal pressure is model as, as a constant uh, volume. And this volume can push on the thorax and the pelvic floor. When the transversal muscle uh, squeezes this volume, and this way, this, this column, this, this cylinder, looks as a spine expansion. In other words, the transversal and, and this is an important element of the model. The transverses can work indirect as a spine extension, thereby become a part of the whole recruitment problem. So if the model thinks or, uh, that, that it could use the intra-abdominal pressure to balance an external force, then the model will do it and it will activate the transversal muscle. And the transversal muscle creates the, uh, pressure and then this column and the specialized column will push on the floor and the pelvic floor. Um, we also set a limit of the, uh, the intra-abdominal pressure. And this limit was set to 26.6 kilopascal, which was based on real measurements on well-trained subjects. And this was done by, uh, by Martin Essen Group in his PhD work, uh, Significance of Intra-Abdominal Pressure and Work-Related Trunk Load, which was published in 2003. And he also published more work, also uh, for example, in the spine and also the journal bi biomechanics about this intra-abdominal pressure. I think it's worthwhile reading. Yeah, I put up this slide actually to remind you that uh, you can still ask questions both during the presentation and, and after the presentation, so don't hesitate to do that. 
All right, let's start to talk about validation. And as most of you probably know, this is a big challenge, but it's also very important that we try to validate this knowledge. And it is a big challenge because we have so many parameters in, uh, in our model. So what we did was we had two approaches. Um, the first approach is kind of a rough uh, approach. We looked at the maximum extension mom moment uh, our model can produce. And the second approach was that we made a comparison with in vivo intradiscal pressure measurements uh, of the L4, L5 disk, which, were, which was available uh, from the literature. So let's start to talk about this maximum extension moment of the lumbar spine. So what we did in the model, we, we had a force. Um, you can see here the force factor on the thoracic part, and this force we increase each time. And of course, when we increase this force, then uh, and we ask uh, the model to stay in upright position, uh, so the person or the model has to activate the spine expenses more and more. So now you see a little bit of activity in the spine expenses because the force is still small. So when we increase the force, uh, we can visualize this that uh, the muscles get more red, so they activate it more which is uh, that's not a surprise. But at some point, the muscles, the muscle force, uh, sorry, the this four, this blue uh, factor gets so large that that overactivated, they get, they get a higher activation than one in the model, which basically means that in reality, the body is overloaded. So we can view that in a different way in this uh, in this figure, here on the x-axis, you have the moment of the L5 to one level in Newton meter. Here you have the max muscle activity, and the max muscle activity is the basically the uh, activity of no, sorry, it's basically the maximum activity uh, of a muscle. It doesn't uh, really matter which muscle it is, but it's just the maximally activated muscle. So when you increase the moment, uh, you see an increase of the muscle activity, of the max muscle activity. And at some point, the muscle activity gets one, uh, and then afterwards, it gets higher than one. And if the muscle activity gets higher than one, it basically means that the muscle uh, uh, are not strong enough anymore. So the maximum extension moment our model can do is this value here, which is 238 Newton meter. So here, and, and, uh, here are the results of this simple test. So we found uh, a maximum extension moment uh, around the uh, level of L5 of 238 Newton meter. And at this moment, um, this uh, 238 newton meter, we had an extra force, estimated extra force in the L5 is one disk of 4,520 newton and a force of 639 newton. Well, these these numbers are uh, in, in in the range you can find in the literature. And, uh, in this paper, I talked about this uh, this uh, review published in Spine by Lona Henson. Um, she, she has uh, uh, a description of this, uh, different values uh, for this maximum uh, extension moment. So these values are in the range, but I also I need to say that the range is actually uh, very big uh, in the literature. The second thing we did was to make a comparison with the uh, intradiscal pressure machines. And for that purpose, we, uh, we used the article written by uh, Wilke and co-authors published in the Clinical Biomechanics in 2001. And I also have listed here the, the website. So they had one subject, and the subject was actually this guy here, uh, Peter Nace, who, where they, um, uh, they measured the interdiscal pressure by, uh, by uh, a pressure to use it in the L4, L5 disk. And they measured 
uh, this is in different situations, in uh, standard situations, lifting situations, also sitting situations. So the situations we uh, uh, we are going to use here is the situation where the guy trades with a weight of 19.8 kilograms, uh, about 60 centimeters in uh, front of the chest. And in this situation, we measure uh, a pressure. 1.8 megapascal in this L4 or L5 disk. And then measured the disk area as well by MRI, and that was 18 square centimeters. And with this information, um, you can estimate uh, the actual force, uh, which is the vehicle value 3,240 newton. Let's com compare this with, uh, with the model. And so we, we tried to mimic these situations in the model as well. Um, and we did it actually in two ways. The first way was uh, without intra-abdominal pressure. And the second um, was with intra-abdominal pressure turned on. So here are the results. Um, without intra-abdominal pressure, we had uh, an estimation of the actual force in the L4 or L5 disk of 3,410 newton. And with the intra-abdominal pressure turned on, we had uh, an estimation of 2,776 newton. So in our model, in this case, uh, um, the intra-abdominal pressure can unload the spine by roughly 18 percent. However, I should say that there's still some uncertainties in this intra-abdominal pressure model. Um, Uncertainty is actually the maximal uh, pressure possible because we, we used uh, an, a maximal pressure which was measured on the highly trained subjects. So it could actually be a little bit lower. But moreover, the attachment point for us of this pressurized column is a very important parameter because it basically um, gives you the moment on of the of this uh, intra-abdominal pressure relative to the spine. Um, so there are some uncertainties, but still I think concerning these um, uncertainties, uh, we are in uh, a good neighborhood of, of this 3,230 newton. So, um, as I said, there, there are still some uncertainties in the intra-abdominal pressure model. However, the, the, the model is flexible because we're using this uh, script language. It is easy to turn it on and off. Um, it's also important to realize that we did not include ligaments in the model. And there is actually some, some evidence in the literature that the influence of the ligaments might be limited uh, when we talk about uh, the moments in the racing capacity of the ligaments. Um, it is possible to include ligaments, and it's actually relatively easy. However, you need to know the right parameters. You need to know the right mechanical properties of the ligaments uh, around the spine. Because if you include ligaments and you have the wrong properties, this might actually uh, suddenly you might have very high forces in your model. So it is really important that you have the right parameters. Another thing is that at the moment um, we use a very simple model in our, our lumbar spine model. Um, we have a master model where the only parameter which is the maximum force of each physical uh, model. Independent of the, the length of the muscle and also independent of the shortening velocity of that muscle. Um, so we do not include at the moment force length relations and force velocity relations. However, it is possible to switch to a more complex muscle model, uh, which is based on the Hill model, with uh, force length uh, properties and force velocity properties and also passive muscle and fitness. But also here, uh, in order to do that, you need to have more parameters in the model. Uh, for example, you need to know the optimal fiber length, you need to know uh, uh, the, the 
dependent flex times and these kind of things. And they are difficult to find for all the muscle factor receptors we have in our mind. But it's possible to do and it's actually very easy to switch to a more complex model, provided that you have the necessary parameters. So let's talk about some uh, future and ongoing work. And uh, I would like to tell you a little bit about uh, the shift of spine. And the cervical spine is also a very interesting uh, structure. Um, a couple of reasons. Uh, um, if you, from a more clinical uh, perspective, a lot, lots of people have, have neck and shoulder problems, and many of these problems are related to, uh, to working situations and to a working process. Um, office work, for example, um, leads to, uh, to neck and shoulder problems uh, in a lot of people, especially when they sit in the same fixed position for many hours a day. Um, also, so you have to realize that actually our heads, they are very heavy. Um, they are about four to five kilograms and, and uh, on, a, on a small pin. So you, can, you can consider that as a small pin where you have to balance a, a ball of four or five kilograms on top of it. Um, you can see it when you uh, observe small babies. They have really problems to, uh, to balance the head and start of the life. And uh, all the muscles we have around the surface of the spine, they are necessary to stabilize uh, the head. And it's actually a big challenge also for our central nervous system. So in that sense, it's a very interesting uh, structure. It is also a very complex mechanical system. Uh, you have uh, many degrees of freedom, and you have many segments, and you have also very many, many, many muscles of the cervical spine. So the cervical spine consists of seven vertebrae, um, and the two top vertebrae, the atlas, also called C1, and the axis, also called C2, they have a very special design. Um, the atlas, um, uh, on top of the atlas we have the head, and uh, the movement between the head and the atlas is uh, uh, for a large uh, way responsible for flexion, flexion and extension of, of, uh, of the head. Um, and the movement between the C1, the atlas, and the axis, the C2, uh, you have this small pin here. Uh, the movement between between these two vertebrae, they are uh, responsible for a large um, for a large part of the rotation in, in the neck. Uh, the rest of the vertebrae in the, in the, in the, in the cervical spine, uh, from C3 to C7, they are more or less. Um, they are not totally the same, but they look more like the ones we have in the lumbar spine. But the two tops, they have a very special design. Um, we have based uh, the, the, the neck model on work uh, by Marika van der Horst. Uh, she wrote a PhD thesis uh, about the neck model. And the neck model she designed was mainly used in, uh, in press test uh, analysis and in order to, uh, to analyze whiplash. And this was done at the University of Eindhoven in cooperation with uh, KNO. Uh, our how the applications of the, the net model we have in mind is, of course, somewhat different than uh, crest analysis because that's not something you can do with inverse, anal uh, inverse dynamics. But a lot of information in the PFP piece is we, we could reuse, and that's what we have done. And if people are interested, they can download this, uh, this work from this website here. Um, we a lot of muscle fascicles uh, in the cervical spine, and we estimate uh, that we need approximately 130, uh, 140 muscle fascicles, uh, and that, that's really a lot. Um, so here you see also here on, on, on the figures on the right side uh, the, uh, the different movements possible in the, in the neck. Um, 
Well, there's also a uh, lateral extension, which is not uh, illustrated here. Um, because of this uh, surface spine model, uh, it, it will become visible in the public repository at some point. And also here, it is very important that we try to validate uh, these models. Um, which again, it, 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 it is a challenge. Uh, we try to, uh, to do that in the beginning of next year. There we, we have planned some validation experiments. And most probably, we will use uh, wire electrodes to, uh, in order to obtain EMG signals. Um, there are only a few muscles in the surface spine you can, uh, you can measure with surface electrodes. Uh, but the deeper muscles are also very interesting, and, and we, we hope to, uh, uh, to get those with, with wire electrodes. Um, and also, another aspect uh, which I have not talked about yet, they are the facet joints. The lumb both the lumbar spine and the cervical spine at the moment do not, uh, we have not included facet joints yet, but we know they are important at some patients. Especially when, uh, in the neck, uh, they are important when, uh, when when you go to extreme extension uh, of the neck. So we really would like to improve the facet joints, um, and that's what we also plan to do in, uh, in, in the coming year. So in conclusion, I would like to. Uh, 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 I hope I would like to start with, uh, with saying that we hope that the model uh, will be downloaded, both the, the lumbar spine and also the surgical spine model, when that becomes uh, available. And I would really like that people are kind of critical to the model and try to improve the model wherever it is possible. We are absolutely sure that the model is not perfect, and there are lots, lots of ways uh, it can be improved. And it would be even better if people, when they have improved the model, uh, they will give the model back uh, and make the public available. It's also important uh, to, to notice that I think it's still important that the model is validated for particular purposes, for uh, particular uh, research questions. And of course, we hope that people are going to use the, the model for solving their research questions or hypothesis. Uh, you might have. So, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I would like to point you uh, to websites if you people are interested in uh, papers and articles and references, and also the model repository. They have to go to the research part of the Anybody website. Uh, and if people want to try out the, these models uh, in the software, they can uh, software. You can download the software and documentations at the, the website of anybody technology. So now it's